You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach. I want to confess, I'm having trouble telling time. I mean, I wear an old-fashioned wristwatch and I can tell you the time, but time passed. It's hard to measure for me. When my kids were younger, it was easier because, you know, you know when your kids started talking, started walking, started doing things, started school, and you have that academic calendar. So you remember that the ski trip was when Toby was in the fourth grade sort of thing, or that, oh, that happened last year at Peter's eighth grade graduation. And then there are the pictures the parents take constantly. But the only annual markers I really have are those of, I don't know, birthdays and anniversaries of my loved ones. And then March 13th, 2020, when New York's cultural institutions were quickly shut down. On the 14th, I know that we had lunch with friends. And then I didn't leave my apartment for one month. I didn't leave it for one month. Life is either for me pre-COVID or post-COVID. And that much is clear. Furthermore, life before Trump was a relatively delicious one. You know, the good old days. I'd go to a concert or a play or a movie, and I could fully immerse myself in what I saw and experienced. Whereas I didn't have to think of art as therapeutic. Post-Trump, there's a good chance I would go to something and I couldn't even focus on it because I was so pissed off by the latest corruption or hypocrisy. We have just a few weeks to try to stanch the hemorrhaging of infections brought on by this super spreader and his gang and their insistence that science is irrelevant. He seems to have even rendered his own doctors irrelevant. We cannot waste time. I'm super excited that Andrew Weissman, a longtime Justice Department prosecutor and lead prosecutor for Robert Mueller in the special counsel's office, is our guest. He's written a new account of that experience called Where Law Ends Inside the Miller Investigation, published by Random House. But first, my five things. Number one, journalism. And I mean real journalism performed by real reporters, not spin, not analysis, not opinion. I'm talking about digging up facts and then explaining them clearly. It is not easy work. It is not glamorous work. It is hard work, not well paid and often dangerous. And there are a lot of unheralded heroes these days, reporters who've broken stories, David Korn of Mother Jones and Michael Shear of the New York Times, who actually has COVID now. And the two Lachlans, Marquet and Cartwright of the Daily Beast and Julia Yaffe at GQ, they're great. And so are so many others. Number two, online art. When you need a break, and we all do. I know some friends on Twitter who only post paintings and poems. And that's a good thing. I mean, I don't do it. It's a good thing to remember that there are other things in life between politics and partisanship. Number three, FaceTiming with the bebe. I have a grand <coughs> grandson who lives in California with his parents, to whom I'm also related. Our schedules are complementary. He wakes up early and I wake up late. And between the two and the three hour time difference, we often have breakfast together. And that's a fun five minutes until I turn into a totally ridiculous person making ridiculous, insane sounds. But it's certainly something that makes my life better. Number four, cornmeal. Okay, wait, hear me out. I've always loved corn muffins, but some cake recipes call for a little bit of cornmeal in them. Oh, it feels so crunchy and modern. Note to self, maybe it's time to learn how to bake a corn muffin. Hmm. Number five, hope. I know we have felt so much despair in these dystopic months. Some weeks I've had to drag myself to the computer to come up with five things that make my life better. But I still have hope, and we must all have hope and hang on to that. Coming up, Mueller investigation prosecutor Andrew Weissman. Don't go away. My guest, Andrew Weissman, is a leading American prosecutor, and as you know, he was a lead investigator for the Mueller investigation. 
And his new book, Where Law Ends Inside the Mueller Investigation, is a stunner filled with actual textural nuanced information about how the investigation happened, what it's like, what the rooms look like. Andrew, I was so impressed with your book. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Lisa. The idea that you people doing some of the most precious and important work of statehood are working under such terrible conditions was one of the revelations of your book for me. I mean, in addition to working in crummy space that nobody else had or wanted or used to be storage space, you're working under tremendous time pressure. And in this case, you're wondering if the president is going to fire you. How how did you, you know, have the get up and go every day? Well, I, I'm glad that that came through because I really wanted to convey what it was like for 22 months to be living in that kind of pressure cooker um, and right. not knowing from one day to the next whether you would be going to work. So, you know, people have talked a lot about the parts of my book that are critical of some of the decisions that Robert Mueller made. But this is an area where the thing that made it easy to go to work is working for Robert Mueller. You know, he's just been around and he's level headed and calm. And he was just wonderful at saying, just let's keep our head down, let's do your work. I mean, just, I mean, he was a wonderful person to calm the waters and keep you focused. Well, you do make that point throughout the book that you revered him. That was the word you chose at some points to say, and and that he was kind of the ideal boss for this work. For many, many months on this show, he was my number five of my five good things (laughs) of the week. And then when the investigation was over, a lot of people said, ha ha, you still love Mueller now? But Mueller just seems to be the model of a civil servant, yet he he said to you, like on the first day, have you made any indictments yet? And he was serious. He wanted indictments, right? Yeah, what he was saying basically is no dilly-dallying, or as he likes to say, stop playing with your food, which was his <laughs> way, you know, his way of saying, you know, cut to the chase, do what you need to do. We, you know, hone it down to its essential and move forward. Um, he, he didn't literally mean just go ahead and invade. Right. I mean, there had to obviously be the facts and the law and it had to be appropriate, but he w- wants people to act quickly. Right. But at the same time, he is a man of few words. <laughs> yeah. So you had to sort of, well, you'd worked for him before as the chief counsel, I think, for the FBI. Exactly. Exactly. So I knew him pretty well. I th- it sounds like you would have had to have known him well in order to have not felt discouraged along the way. Yeah. No. I mean, look, he was an ideal uh, an ideal person to report to, and particularly in a high profile, high stakes, high pressured environment. You know, he ran the FBI for 12 years and famously took over just as 9-11 happened. So you know, in this situation, he, he took to it, frankly, like a duck to water. I mean, no one was going to literally die. And the, the thing that kept him up at night and worried him constantly for 12 years as the head of the FBI. So this was something that he really could sink his teeth into, but also convey a sense of calm and rectitude to all of us. And these are concepts that we have not seen in the public side of government in the last four years, to say the least. Couldn't agree with you more. (laughs) Um, Now, Andrew, a lot of people are just learning about who you are, people who weren't on the inside of the judicial and justice system and Department of Justice. Your background was in prosecuting the mob for many years with the Eastern District of New York. Uh, a lot of people describe this administration as running like the mob. W- what do you say to that? When I first heard Jim Comey refer to the president and his seeking uh, essentially an oath of loyalty, that it was like the mob, I mm-hmm. remember at the time chalking it up to, oh, Jim, it's, that's such hyperbole. You know, the mob kills people. I mean, it's a, it's a completely different organization. But After 22 months of working on the special counsel's office, I mean, obviously there are big differences, but that sense of imperiousness, 
of complete loyalty to the group. And one of the ways I, I actually, there's more direct ways. Um, one of the ways that the president kept people from cooperating is he used his power to dangle pardons. And in the mob, the way they kept people from cooperating is they would actually just threaten to or, or actually kill them. Um, mm. But they both had this power to interfere with a criminal investigation through these unusual powers. So there, there are analogies to be made, even though, of course, they're, you know, they're huge differences. You were specifically in charge of Team M, which was the Manafort investigation. When you joined it, you or when you started when uh, at the beginning of this uh, special counsel investigation, Manafort already had, I think you said, four different investigations that were running but weren't really going anywhere. So that was um, somewhat dispiriting. And, you know, I'd be interested in your reaction because, you know, one of the things that, of course, as we start, we go around seeing what's been done already so that we could figure out what are our most promising leads, what we're going to take over, et cetera. So, you know, I did that for Team M, and it, it's unusual to say the least. Um, there was one investigation of, of Manafort that had been up and running for three to four years, which you know, in and of itself is an oddity. I mean, under the Mueller view of don't play with your food, three to, <laughs> right. three, three to four years is not really a Mueller time frame. <laughs> that, uh-huh. So uh-huh. I, I really give all credit to the agents and the analysts on Team M because we really started in June or July of 2017. And by October of 2017, just a few months, we had indicted Paul Manafort in a really strong, devastating case for Mm -hmm. tax fraud and money laundering and violation of the Foreign Agents Registration Act. So it shows what an, you know, when you have an incredible team behind you, you can really make huge strides. Well, speaking of that team, you also tease out in Where Law Ends the relationship between the FBI agents and the lawyers in a big investigation like yours. And I've never seen anything like that before in terms of who does what. I mean, you as a lawyer are investigating every bit as much as your FBI colleagues. Yeah. I mean, I really wanted to give people a sense of what it was like day to day. What happens when you land in an invest the beginning of an investigation? How do you get started? What do you do? You know, there used to be an old school model where the FBI investigates and when they're done, they sort of come to your office as a prosecutor and they present the case in a, we used to say in a box with a bow. <laughs> Meaning uh-huh. you, you just, right. you, it's like a present, you open it up and it's all done. And instead You know, what's really happens is you become very close to the agents and analysts. They tell you how to prosecute. You tell them how to investigate. My my agents used to say it's like a marriage. And at times they'd say, no, it's like a a bad marriage, you know, because it's just this incredible camaraderie and respect on both sides when it's working really well. And could you just explain how neutral you are all expected to be that this investigation proceeds without any spin and without any preference? Sure. That's one where I remember when I got to the FBI, it was, um, I was the general counsel. It was so palpable at that institution that politics played no part at all. There was only one political appointee, which was the FBI director. Everybody else was mm-hmm. career and has been there for 10, 20, even 30 years. And no one cares and, or even talks about sort of, are you a Democrat or a Republican? It, <sighs> it's just irrelevant. If the facts are that somebody did something wrong, they're going to be prosecuted if it, you know it's an appropriate case. And it's just nothing that, that you think about. And you know, one of the ways I try to phrase this is, you know, the fact that I'm a Democrat, does that make Paul Manafort any less guilty? We had a jury trial where he's convicted beyond a reasonable doubt. He then pled guilty. The fact that he is a Republican or members of our team or Democrats and Republicans is is just irrelevant. Um, that particular type of thinking that goes on in Washington and the political world is just nothing that happens in law enforcement or the, in the intelligence community when it's operating correctly. Well, that's something that needs to be broadcast over and over and over again, because of course, in this divided and and partisan time in which we live, people think, oh, he's a Democrat. Oh, he's on MSNBC. He must be out to get them. 
You know, I mean, I think that's how people think these days. Yeah. Not, of course, people who listen to this podcast, but yeah. in the in the world at large, yeah. Well, well I do think, I could say I have two points on that. One is, I don't think it's wrong for people to ask about motive and to say, you know, is it possible that the motive led to some specific action that was political, but you need to tether it to that. You know, my analogy is like, you might inherit money from somebody who dies. That doesn't mean you killed them. You might have, yeah. a, you might have a motive <laughs> because you got money, but you know, you need to connect it. But, you know, it is also the case that we have seen people in government, including at the Department of Justice, take actions that are politically motivated. Since I left the department, I've been very critical of Attorney General Barr. And I think he has taken actions that are based on politics. So, you know, I do think it's it's a legitimate question, um, but you do have to connect it to what exactly is the action that you're questioning. Right, right. Okay, on that score, Bill Barr and Robert Mueller and their spouses, I think, are were friends or are friends or were friends. Uh, could you please explain that? Well, they certainly were friends, and the attorney general, when he was going through his confirmation hearing, testified to that. My understanding is I I don't think that the attorney general and Robert Mueller have had a continuing friendship since right. since March 24th of 2019. When he diminished the work of 22 months and 4,000 pages or whatever and misled the public about the report altogether. What's going on with Barr? How, how ca- he seems like he's a toady to Trump. History will not treat him kindly. I have a theory that this is tied up to Jeffrey Epstein and Bill Barr's father, Donald Barr, who was the headmaster of Dalton and who hired Jeffrey Epstein and launched his uh, journey of evil. But uh, other than that, I wonder what the hell is going on with Bill Barr. The way I deal with things like that is I tend to, in this situation, not focus on motive because I don't know. I don't know him. It's a little bit like when people were criticizing James Comey for what he did in July and October of 2016. I don't know whether Jim Comey is a good person who made a bad mistake or a bad person who made a bad mistake. I just know he made a bad mistake. Actually, Um, according to your book, he made two. Absolutely. With Barr, I look at what he did in this Roger Stone case um, where he changed the sentencing recommendation. I look at what he did in the Flynn case. And the issue is not as he says, which is he said, oh, you know, I have the power as the attorney general not to listen to the school children, the Montessori school children, which is <laughs> yeah. um, in the department, which, you know, of course, is so incredibly demeaning to make that analogy when you're running the yes. organization of, of people who are wonderful, wonderful colleagues. That's not the issue. The issue is not that he does or does not have the power. It's how he's exercising that power. And he is providing a benefit to people who are connected to the president that he is not provided to people who are not connected to the president. So, you know, what he did for Roger Stone is not done for anyone else. What he did for Michael Flynn is not done for anyone else. And, you know, as a lawyer, they put forward a legal theory for Michael Flynn that was advantageous to Michael Flynn. That same legal theory is one that Department of Justice actually opposes in every other case. Mm, Right. So what's in it for him? I mean, he wrote a letter to the president saying he believed in a kind of imperial presidency, but why? How does that serve him? I don't know the answer other than to answer that by the effect, which is, you know, people viewed that initial letter he wrote as sort of his audition, and he was now serving up the Department of Justice to not be an independent check and one of the guardrails that's so important to our democracy. And just to be on my soapbox, Lisa, for a moment, you know, oh, please. What, what separates us from Ukraine and so-called third world countries is the rule of law. So mm-hmm. in Ukraine, and this is something my college classmate, Marie Ivanovich, spoke about. In Ukraine, oh, no kidding. Yeah, we oh, both, wow. We both graduated the same year from Princeton. And she spoke about how they were trying to import the rule of law to Ukraine because famously the... President Yanukovych, the sort of Putin-installed president, 
prosecuted his his opponent. Yeah, actually, his yeah. female political opponent. Um, right. And at the time, this is an oddity. His campaign manager was Paul Manafort. Fast ah, forward to 2016, forward. you have Paul Manafort being the campaign manager for Donald Trump, running on lock her up. Um, so the analogy Which he was, had done, yeah. So you don't want a regime where the rule of law is, it, it doesn't exist, and you have people just going after their political opponents and using the Department of Justice in that way. And that's one of the reasons, you know, I think just to make this somewhat political, Joe Biden was asked about what should happen to Donald Trump if he were to become president, if Joe Biden was. And he said, that's going to be for my attorney general to make that decision. And that's as it should be. You need to separate the Department of Justice, it's not a weapon that can be used by the political parties. And just to make it even clearer just how pernicious Bill Barr is, Bill Barr said that exact thing in his confirmation hearing, that the mm-hmm. Department of Justice cannot be a lever used by those in power against their opponents. But I, th- I really think that is what we've been seeing. I'm rubber, you're glue, you know? I mean, it just is so wrong. And everybody who cares about this country is aware that the Justice Department has been tainted so terribly. We're not even aware, as you are, of all the judges who've been appointed, of all the political hurdles or uh, dog whistles they've been answering to in the in the new Justice Department. Yeah, and one, one thing I think it's important for people to know is career people at the Department of Justice and alumni of the Department of Justice feel this way, whether they're Democrats or Republicans. In other words, a lot of us have served in many, many different administrations, and it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you know in your bones that the politicization of the Department of Justice is antithetical to everything that the country is supposed to be about. So it really is something that's just, it's not viewed through a political lens. Right, right. Has there ever been a president who misused the Department of Justice and was able to deploy it for his own purposes before Donald Trump? Well, Nixon. Um, But I think this is more severe. Yeah. Yeah, Well, but Nixon, we thought Nixon, we were kids, you and I, but we thought Nixon was the worst president ever. But he read the Constitution. And I think other than (laughs) when he tried to subvert the election, he actually cared about the United States of America and where it stood in the world. I don't get that impression now. I agree with you. I think just to take Watergate and compare that to Russian election interference, Watergate Watergate was election interference too, but on a very small scale. And everyone knew that breaking into an office to steal DNC documents is bad and is a crime. (laughs) But you you have this president thinking welcoming foreign election interference, as long as they're going to help me, what's the problem? And brazenly asking for it to this day. Right. Even famously, the day after Robert Mueller testified in Congress, you had what resulted in the president being impeached, which is his, his conversation where he was, for lack of a better term, extorting the new Ukraine president to open an investigation. Sure sounded like it to me. Okay, um, before we get to your five things, and honestly, I'd love to talk about a million, I have a million questions for you. I'd like to be your your paralegal (laughs) in my next life. Um, How do you think this all ends? Actually, this isn't my last question. I have to go back to something that you mentioned and I glossed over, which is, you know, Mueller is your mentor. Mueller is the guide to this. It's a huge honor to be running a division of this huge, historically important investigation. And then you write your book and he 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 was offended, I guess, by it. You wrote that he well, didn't push hard enough and, and he didn't come to the conclusions that you would have had. So one great thing about Robert Mueller is he is really good with dissent and disagreement, and he's very good about changing his mind on issues Mm -hmm. if he thinks you've got a good argument. And what's great is he has that view, whether it's coming from a 
you know, first year employee at the FBI or the, you know, the deputy director of the FBI. And it, ultimately, though, when I wrote this book, I was thinking about all of the external challenges of Bill Barr, of the White House, the power to pardon, mm-hmm. the power to fire. But I also realized as I was writing it that I needed to look up, you know, look in a mirror as to how we dealt with those challenges and what we did well. And there were many, many things we did well. But I also mm-hmm. wanted to point out things where I had a disagreement. And I, I think I tried very hard to give the reader a sense of what Robert Mueller's thinking was, because it always came from a very noble place, but I wanted to right. point out where I disagreed. Right, right. And is it upsetting, disappointing, or a big nothing, uh, his reaction to the book and where you and he are now? Well, he knew I was writing a book and blessed it. And so, you know, I I don't know. I, I would hope he would read it and think, okay, I, we have you know, he's entitled to his views. But, you know, as Bob Mueller used to say when I was at the FBI, we're here to protect democracy, not to practice it. Um, meaning mm. meaning that the, mm. the FBI director, like the special counsel, he makes the choices and those were his decisions. But this is a free country and people are, I think, in the public is entitled to debate those decisions. And right. obviously, Bob Mueller um, thought long and hard about this. And I'm not surprised he's saying, look, I stand by what I did. But I think the point of this is for people to be able to think about it, as well as also to think about the special counsel rules we operated under to figure out whether those are really the rules that we need to have in place if, God forbid, this were to happen again. Yeah, no, I think you've made that very clear. In fact, you say, on the one hand, it looks like this, but in the Justice Department, we look at it this way. And for everybody who has an opinion and is curious about how the report was, let's say, nuanced and wasn't all obstruction and it wasn't all indictments, this gives you the background on how decisions were made and how the process worked. And it's like a mystery story. I mean, it's really full of suspense, even though we kind of know how that part of the tale ends. But Andrew, how do you think this all ends for Trump and Barr? Well, for Donald Trump, it'll be very interesting because if he is not reelected, the Department of Justice then is free to decide whether he committed a crime and should be charged. And the Manhattan District Attorney's Office that has, by all accounts, an active investigation. They're, they were always free and will still be free if they make an appropriate case to go forward. So I think at the very least, Donald Trump is mm-hmm. will have significant legal issues. And, and Bill Barr, how will he be treated and where does he go? Well, I, I think um, one of the things that I know, there, there are a lot of people in the Department of Justice and outside of the Department of Justice who are alums who are... I think going to be very vocal about ways to assure that we don't have another attorney general like this because Mm -hmm. it's, you know, I worked at the department for over 20 years and it's so soul crushing to see what's happened to the department and its independence. It's, Mm -hmm. It's so central to a democracy for the reasons we talked about. So I, you know, Bill Barr famously said, you know, history belongs to the winners. And I, I unfortunately do agree with him on that. And I'm hoping mm-hmm. I'm hoping that the side that believes in the independence of the Department of Justice is the winning side. Can he be disbarred? Uh, and no pun intended. Right. No, no pun intended. Yeah, he could be. You know, I think those are always very complicated issues. But You know, I think more important than that, given that, you know, I don't see him practicing law too much um, after this, I think it's more important to have a consensus that the things that he did in the department and the relationship of the Department of Justice to the White House cannot repeat itself under whether under either administration. It's it's not appropriate for whether you have a Democrat or a Republican in office. Well, it's not political. It's ethical. Exactly. Exactly. So I want to once again commend this book, Where Law Ends. It is just fascinating and so clearly written. And Andrew, I love your list of your five things. (laughs) So let's briefly review what they are. Number one, 
Number one is the weekend edition of the FT, the Financial Times. That orange paper that you see lying around sometimes in, in airport lounges. Exactly. And it's, uh-huh. it's basically, I view it as like a giant box of chocolate. Uh-huh. There's everything you want. It's beautifully written. The first section brings you up to date on the news. Um, the second section has these incredible book reviews, you know, exhibit reviews of, of art exhibits around the world. There's the lunch with the FT column, which is just (laughs) always delightful. And then in case you just, you need something really like a dessert on top of that Uh box of chocolate, there's the magazine section, which is is so British because it's called How to Spend It. And it's completely (laughs) over the top. I mean, it's for, you know, the 1% of the 1%, but it's, again, it's just, it's a fun thing for the, to have on the weekend. Well, especially after the the gritty work of the week Absolutely. that you had to do. Yep. Yeah. 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 Doesn't it also have some real estate in it? It does. It does have a real yeah. estate where, again, it's way <laughs> beyond anything I could think about as a government lawyer, but, you know, it, it was fun to look at. Yeah, absolutely. And number two... Carnegie Hall, which is in my hometown, Mm -hmm. in your hometown of of New York City. And, you know, Carnegie Hall is both a complete oasis of sort of 19th century grandeur. The live music in New York City is just so wonderful, or at least it used to be Mm pre-COVID. And the one other little advantage as you you and I are aging is you can go to Carnegie Hall and you feel really young. Um, (laughs) Yes. It tends to get an, an older crowd. So. Yes, that's true. That's true. And also, we almost lost Carnegie Hall. Yeah. And I really appreciate the effort it took to bring it back and Isaac Stern and yes. the whole, there's a beautiful history to it. Yeah, the building is, the building's spectacular. Inside. It's spectacular. Yep. Yep, it is. Uh, number three. Uh, number three is the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, which is like going to like your grandmother's attic, except that it's a museum. And <laughs> it's um, maybe it's a little bit like the FT weekend in that it's such an incredible hodgepodge. There's always something fascinating to see. And it's so British. Um, and you know, when the weather's not great in London, just going to that museum is just one of the really fun, great things. Um, you always leave having learned something. So it's just great. I, yes, there was supposed to be, I guess last year, there was an exhibit about Christian Dior that was supposed to be, you know, mind blowing. Now, I wouldn't have thought. But I guess because of all the curatorial work they do, and they do, they have weird stuff. Yes. In addition to wonderful yes. things. Yes, that mixture is, just makes it so, the serendipity of the mixture is yes. so much fun. Yes, absolutely. Okay, number four. Uh, number four is the Adirondacks, which is in upstate New York. And I think because I live in New York City and and I've had a lot of high pressure jobs, what's so great is that New York State, in addition to having New York City, has the largest federal national park in the country, which is the Adirondacks. Um, which nobody knows. Everybody thinks it's Utah or Wyoming or something, but it's really here. Exactly. Now, it's a little unusual because there is private property in the park, but it's heavily regulated. But it is the mm-hmm. largest federal park uh, in the country, and it it is a great escape. And, you know, if you're looking for sort of getting away from the city and turning off and, you know, not having Wi-Fi and all of these sort of electronic gadgets all the time and just, you know, really being back to nature. It's a, it's a wonderful escape. I know there are lots of other places for that, but for me, that's been within reach and provides that solace. I understand that. And on the other side is your number five. The other, yes, the other side is the New York subway. And having lived in in Washington, D.C. on and off for about 10 years. I love the New York subway. It is what America, it is what America should be. There's every race and nationality and class and, you know, there's high and low. Everything's there. Yes, yeah. And you know what? And everyone's getting along. And maybe it's because they have to, but it's just, it really, to me, is what you want our country to look like. Well, and it's just very practical. That's what I like about it. It used to be when we were growing up that it wasn't safe or your parents preferred you not take it. Yes. But 
you know what? You're right. It's just democratic in the small d sense. Small uh, d. Absolutely. But and you're right. It is the only way to get around in the city. And and it's a fun spectacle. <laughs> I I agree. I agree. Andrew, just a real pleasure to talk to you. And uh, uh, I wish you so much luck with the book. Thank you so much. It was really fun being here. You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest this week has been Andrew Weissman, MSNBC legal analyst, professor at NYU Law School, and lead prosecutor in Robert Mueller's special counsel office. His new book, Where Law Ends, Inside the Mueller Investigation, is a must read, and it's published by Random House. You can follow Andrew on Twitter at A Weissman underscore. My blog is at lisabernbach.com, where you'll find links and photos to all the things in the program, including Carnegie Hall. This podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Kevin Watkins. My team is Espresso Rucci, Michael Port, Boko Haft, and Sam Haft. Until next week, wear a mask and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers. <laughs>